I know that lots of us look to collaborate with each other, and that's why we've got a presentation on uh, joint ventures this evening. Um, and I'm going to run through some areas in which I think you should protect yourself with uh, joint ventures, um, and uh, some of the things you may not have thought about when you set up joint venture agreements. Um, now, the one thing that's going to be important here is just to mention there are two different ways in which you might work with people typically. So when, you work, when you're lending from a bank like Shawbrook Bank, they're perfectly happy if you take a loan from a private investor. Okay? So a bank like Birmingham Midshires or the Mortgage Works, TMW, that do buy-to-let mortgages, they are not happy if you take money off another private investor to do your deal. Okay? So as long as you're using the right lender with the right purpose, if you're using private funds, use the right lender. We've got lenders that are happy with you doing that. Uh, but there are certain terms and conditions in which they want to make sure, obviously, that their interest in that asset is protected. Okay? That's a conversation for another time. What I want to establish is what we're going to go through this evening is joint ventures. And joint ventures is not when you take money off somebody on a loan note. Okay? So if, you take, if you've got a fixed term loan with somebody that you're going to do a property up with, the property's in your name, and you're then going to pay them back afterwards, that's not a joint venture. That's on a fixed term as well. Okay? If you're going to pay them a portion of profit, even if they don't own it, then technically that's a joint venture. Okay? And you get into all sorts of nightmares with trying to promote that, etc., when you're promoting it online. And again, that's a conversation we could talk for an hour about, and that's not what this presentation's about. I just want to talk about how you set your agreements up when you've established your agreement. And one of the first things that I learned the hard way when you're doing this is you've got to be careful of greedy people when it comes to joint ventures, okay? And believe it or not, I am not a particularly greedy person. I'm naturally quite a generous person, and that means that you can be quite easily taken advantage of if you're not careful when it comes to things like joint ventures. So I am not a good mix with somebody who is, who is particularly greedy. Um, and one of the ways that you spot that early on in a joint venture agreement is let's say, for example, you've had a chat, you've established what the joint venture is going to be, you're going to do 50-50, um, you know, ownership of a property, let's say, I'm going to put 10 grand in because it's my expertise, I've found the property deal as well, and you're putting in 50 grand, but we're owning 50-50, yeah, that type of thing you might arrange. Uh, and then it's all arranged, it's done, you shake hands on it, and then a week later, you know, before you complete, it's like, well, you, uh, I was thinking about it, Howard, and really you should be putting in 15. When that happens, I now walk away, straight away, because if that's going to happen once, it will keep happening. Um, and, uh, and so once the deal is done, the deal is done. That's really important to me. Um, but let's go into some detail. So you should always make your joint ventures a win-win situation. Without a shadow of a doubt, they've got to be a win for everyone. You are not winning if you're getting one up on the person you're joint venturing with. It should be a genuine um, partnership. And the other thing you need to begin with is working out what you're bringing to the party. You need to work out what you're going to bring to any joint venture party before you even start looking for a property or a joint venture partner to work with. Because if you don't understand your value, then there's not a great deal that you're going to be able to offer to your joint venture partners. Okay? So just be clear about where your value lies. And it could be in the expertise for the property. It could be, uh, it could be in the fact that you've, you've just found the property, but you don't know quite what to do with the property, for example. So you want a joint venture with somebody more experienced. Uh, or it could be the usual one as property investors in an expensive game. You're running out of funds. You want to do more deals. So you look for people to join venture with who bring funds to the party. So there's a whole different level of things that people can bring to each other. Just make sure you're clear uh, about the value that you add. And you should always make sure that your joint ventures are purposeful. So what do I mean by that? Well, firstly, a lot of times, when people first start looking for joint venture partners, they look for people they like. Now, you have to like the people you're going to do business with. But if it's somebody that you particularly like, they've probably got the same kind of nature as you. And if you've got similar personalities, you've probably got similar strengths and weaknesses. And if you've got similar strengths and weaknesses, they're probably not the ideal partner to go into business with. Because you're looking for people that plug your gaps, not have the same gaps in your personality types, if that makes sense. So, you know, that's a big, a big earn. Uh, all parties should always bring value. And the other thing that I learned once upon a time from a, somebody who's become a dear friend, but started as a business coach, and then was a joint venture partner. And now 15 years down the line, we've still got property deals together. We get on famously, um, but we've got to have similar destinations. 
And what that means is, is you've got to have a similar purpose for why you're doing property or understand where that exit is going to be if you're going to go in separate ways at some point in time. So the joint venture partner I've just mentioned is somebody that is considerably older than me, only wants to be in property for the next sort of five years from now. So when we've set up joint ventures in the past and ones we've just set up now, it's a case of in the past it was like 10 years. So Howard, I will give you the opportunity to buy me out in 10 years time. That's, that's the exit point, because I want out at that age, right? And then now we've just done one again, it's the same age and target, so five year fixed rate on a deal, and I'll buy them out in five years time. Does that make sense? And then you agree how the buyout is, etc. So it doesn't mean that your purposes have got to be exactly the same because you're going to hold property forever. You can do long-term joint ventures where you understand and plan your exit now, and you could be holding them for 20 or 30 years. Okay, and also I would say joint venturing on short term deals on development deals is obviously much easier because you're going to be in a relationship for a shorter period of time, particularly better if it's a first uh, joint venture. So with joint ventures, then uh, why do them? Well, it extends the capability that you've got by collaboration, by working with other people. You can do more things. Um, you might have complementary skills. So like we said, where one person's got a gap, you might have a strength and vice versa. Um, you should really be joint venturing. We all have heard this phrase before with people you know and trust. So it's a case of building trust um, and also utilizing your connections. Meetings like this are a great place to joint venture. In our small uh, kind of mentoring group that we run at Harvey Bowes, which we have a, a little group that meets monthly for an afternoon. And there's been over, over a couple of years we've done that, several new joint ventures have formed and people have flourished. And it's fantastic to see that. Uh, really enjoy seeing that. So utilize those, agree those areas. So to get into a little bit of context now, um, you should really use an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. It is not actually the strongest contract in the world, but it does give you a level of protection. The only protection would be the fact that A, somebody is willing to sign it to respect your deal. So let's say you find a deal and you want to talk to people about a deal, then really you should ideally get them to sign an NDA. You can have quite a simple templated NDA and that just helps you to have some protection. And for me, it means a lot if somebody I'm going to talk to about a joint venture openly says at the beginning of a conversation or early on, how would I'm willing to sign an NDA? That puts your mind at rest that you're dealing with somebody that's a very genuine kind of person. So just be aware of that. Uh, what an NDA does really is it protects your deal um, and it protects your interest in that deal uh, because it stops the, the information from being stolen or shared with any competitor or third party. So it restricts that person legally from talking about your deal elsewhere, okay? And that really, if it's stipulated or NDA, would include any direct negotiation they tried to have in terms of trying to cut you out of your own deal. Um, so just bear, and I've seen that happen. Um, so just bear that in mind. How can you demonstrate some credibility then? So you wanna get, so first of all, to back up to that, you wanna get your own NDA. So you've got a templated NDA that you can use, just ask people to sign it, they should be perfectly happy to do that. And that is your first port of call if you're somebody that's bringing deals to the table. Um, how do you demonstrate your credibility? Well, if you've got case studies of successful deals you've done in the past, that's amazing. Uh, if you've had any education through the training programs that are out there, that's also good. Uh, and also obviously any other collaborations you've done. So if you can refer to other joint venture partners um, and you've got references and things, then that also helps to add weight when it comes to um, setting up new ones. So in terms then of setting up the JV itself, uh, we would always suggest you create a business plan, just a simple outline of what your purpose uh, is in property. And if, if you're offering a joint venture on a specific property, maybe what the purpose of that property is now and what it's going to be how you're going to hold it, what you're going to do with it. Always begin with the end in mind. Stephen Covey's Habits of Highly Effective People. So start with where, uh, that's habit number two in the book, by the way. So start with where it is as it sits in your portfolio or if it's a flip, what, what, you know, what's the general, what's the gross development value, what are you going to sell it for and work your way back to the beginning from the end, okay? Um, work out what each party needs. So if you've got the deal and you want to find an investor maybe, then you, it's fairly obvious that what you need is money. But if you've got a deal, work out how much money yeah, you're going to be needing for this deal. Are you going to be putting any money in so you've got a bit of skin in the game? I'm never scared of putting skin in the game. I get people that offer to do joint ventures with me where they'll say, I'll put 100% of the funds in, which is, if they want to do that, that's fine. But I actually prefer to have a little bit of buy-in uh, myself. I think it adds credibility and it helps me mentally as well to feel part of the deal, which is quite important to me personally. 
I would recommend you get a heads of terms, a HOT drafted up and then drawn up by a professional. So ideally a solicitor. Now for this person I've been joint venturing with, I mentioned for 15 years, we just do a HOT between us now. We're very comfortable. We've got property assets for a number of years. You may think that's reckless. Hasn't backfired on me with this individual. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to. I'm not, I'm not a qualified lawyer, so I'm not giving you um, legal advice. Uh, but you would normally, normal practice would be to do a heads of terms between you and your joint venture partner and then get a solicitor to draw it up as a contract. Okay? And then that would be your joint venture agreement. So it starts, with your, it starts in earnest with your HOT, your heads of terms. And we'll go through the sort of things that you should put in your heads of terms as well. Something to consider may be financial associations. So if you're going to be financially associated with somebody, then you want to know ideally what their credit profile is like. So if you're going to share a mortgage together, then that is quite important. I'm sure you'd agree. With a lot of commercial lenders, if it's a limited company and the two of you uh, have shares in that limited company and the limited company has borrowing, you do not get financially linked through that, uh, through that arrangement. Okay? Not with every lender, but with, with a lot of lenders, they don't put a financial association in there. It doesn't mean you can't be tracked to be financially associated to that person and you shouldn't be biased by their financial association, but it can cause problems. So I'm again always happy to produce a copy of my Experian report, which uh, would demonstrate my credibility and my financial status. And for me, it's a little bit easier perhaps because as a regulated CMAP qualified mortgage broker and holding office as a manager of that firm, I have to have clean financial conduct. So there are some aspects of that that become easier for me. But you know what? I've watched successful joint ventures happen even where people have had a blip in the past in their credit and it happens to the best of us. And it can happen even inadvertently where somebody might get um, a, a judgment because you've had a bill from the water board and uh, the Welsh Water have come after you because they come after you on a tenant's old property and they were writing to you at the tenant address and you never knew. Those things happen. We come across that with our clients on a regular basis at Harvey Bowes and when we're arranging mortgages. So I'm not saying that every time you do a joint venture that person's credit should be perfect, but if there is a blip in there, you kind of want to know why. And the way that lenders look at blips, by the way, just to let you know, is if you've got a one-off blip, or perhaps if somebody has a couple of blips around the same time period, it could be a life circumstance. They could have had a blip because of a divorce, because of a bankruptcy going on them, because of a property deal going wrong and they had to put a lot more money into it. And if in a six year profile, because that's what's on your Experian report, there is one blip, even if it's a couple of different things, but one period of time, well, you know that that was what we call a life event. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not somebody who is consistently a non-payer of bills, which is, what you really want to avoid. Um, so there's that side of it. Obviously, you've got to have trust and security, which we'll go into in a little bit more details. But that is, in essence, what you'd contain uh, within your joint venture agreement. So when you're assessing a JV partner, I would want to meet everybody involved. You get plenty of armchair investors that just want to put money in, that's fine. But why not, when you're first doing a deal with somebody, if you are looking to invest, meet the builders, meet that individual's power teams, check their references, even a credit check their builders to make sure that they're uh, of good standing. A development lender will often um, credit check the building contractor that you're going to use if you want to borrow development funds. So if they're going to do it, why wouldn't a joint venture partner? So I think that makes perfect sense um, on that side of it. So let's look at security then. What security might you have? Well, you could have a deed of trust. So a deed of trust is where, in effect, you are promised your, um, your share in a property deal, but you don't go down on any of the particular paperwork. Some lenders will accept this, most lenders will not accept it, but it is acceptable to some lenders. And you can have a simple deed of trust that just says, I'm going to have 30% you know, of the profit at the end, or whatever that might be, for the person who's not on the paperwork. That is probably, it is legally upstanding, but it is probably the weakest form of security you can have. Of course, it's a limited company. You can have some company shares on its own. That's a not enough security. You can have part ownership. But of course, if you have a joint venture where you've got two people setting up a limited company to hold property and the property is then owned by the limited company, well, you've naturally got ownership through your shares. So that's very straightforward. If you were lending all of the money to somebody, uh, then you might hold a first charge on it or you reverse that round, you might be 
the property investor, you're looking for a, a private lender and they, they take a first charge because they're lending you all the money. Any lender would want first charge, of course, bear that in mind. If there was a formal lender like Soma or, or anyone else, um, some lenders will allow a second charge. So as an investor, if you don't want to be part owner, you might have a second charge to sit behind the main lender or you might take security over other assets. So I have in the past allowed a joint venture partner to have a charge on other properties in my portfolio. Okay, so you could also do that if you've got uh, other properties available. There's also a personal guarantee, of course. So you can write a personal guarantee for any loan. Um, and another document you need for your joint venture is I would strongly recommend you get a power of attorney. Again, this is just personal experience. I'm not legally qualified to give advice on the matter, but I would always look to get a power of attorney that is set out specific for that property project. So that if your joint venture partner was run over by a bus, there is a planned route out of that situation. Because otherwise, believe me, we're not gonna go into it tonight, it can be a pretty fraught situation. If you were joint owners in a company, company bank accounts get frozen and all sorts. So you need that power of attorney. Um, and the power of attorney can be quite extensive, obviously, because a power of attorney could say, if I was doing a joint venture with Ben here, who's videoing, then that uh, joint venture between us could say, that if I was knocked over by a bus, that Ben could take over um, the, the full activity of that property or whatever until it was sold, if it was a flip, for example, but everything he had to do had to be approved by my wife, for example. So that could happen. Or it could be a case that the power of attorney says that my wife would step in. What it means is, if I was in a coma in a hospital, the bank accounts aren't frozen, while well, your bridging loan is ticking and you've got a problem. And we have seen it happen. So just be aware of that. It's always useful to get those, that paperwork there. And also, if you've got an interest in an individual because they've got money in your project, or if you're the lender coming in and you're putting more money in than your, your partner and you and you don't want to carry that project on should something happen to them, then for comparatively small amount of cost, you can insure their life because you have an insurable interest in each other's life because of your business partnership. And for a very small amount of money, you can take an insurance policy either as a contingency basis. So it might, you know, you might have put 100 grand into the deal, but you know you don't need to recover all of that. So you might take life cover for 50K, for example. Um, definitely worth doing on a longer term joint venture. If you're doing a 20 year kind of joint venture with somebody and their life is insurable, then you might consider doing that for some security. That can be business uh, led, so it's an expense for your business joint venture as well. So you can be protected within that without affecting your, your personal income. So that just gives you an overview of that side of things. Uh, so we talked about the heads of terms. There are three key documents you really need. Your heads of terms, which becomes your joint venture agreement. If it's a limited company, you also have a shareholder agreement and you'll have articles of association. So what is the difference um, between these? Well, the heads of terms um, is a private document. So that's a document that's between you and whoever you choose to share it with. And you start it at the beginning of the process. Sets out the terms of the agreement and the responsibilities and roles for each of you. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But just to overview these documents. So, oh, so here we are, sorry. So we'll go through the detail now. So what the roles and obligations of each individual are, who's going to be making decisions, and that's quite important, you know, and I learned that the hard way. So on a joint venture I've done fairly recently, there was no stipulation, we didn't need to think about it, about who was making final decisions. We both had a reasonable amount of property knowledge. I've got more experience, time served in property, but relative amount of knowledge. And so just to give you a personal experience on this, um, got a property, bought a property that needed planning. And uh, with the planning, um, my first suggestion as soon as we complete is right, let's get our ecological report, um, our bat report, um, and our, our flood report and our suds report, because we're going to need those things. And the response from my joint venture partner was don't be stupid, don't spend that money yet. Let's get the architect in, let's do all of that first. So I was pretty reluctant to do that. I thought let's get our ducks in a row. Does anybody know when you can do a bat report by the way? Yeah, there's, 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 there's two sections. One's about March time, and one the, other, the other runs up to about October, from August to October, I think. But yes, exactly right. You can only do a bat report at certain times of the year. So if your planning is going to need a bat report, you need to plan for it, right? Otherwise, you could be waiting on a bridging loan to get a bat report to put your planning in if you bought it before you get planning. So in this situation, 
there was no direct who's going to make decisions. It's a 50-50 joint venture, and there was this, this uh, disagreement between us about when we should get the reports. So I was like, okay, I don't mind, we'll get the reports afterwards. Now, the way this joint venture was set up, 100% funds from our joint venture partner, so um, 400 grand, and 200 grand cash from our joint venture partner, and 200 grand that that joint venture partner lent me, so he put all the money into the property, but lent it to me on a loan note, which is okay, and was charging 8.75% interest on that money. So it was only when I looked back at the paperwork, it dawned on me why he didn't want to do the report this year, or last year, he wants to now do the report from March this year, because he's just earned a year's worth of interest out of me, 8.75, hasn't he? Right, which is eaten away at my share of the profit in the deal. So sometimes you've got to watch where the greed is coming from. But that's why you should always make sure that you stipulate how or who is going to make decisions and iron out as much of this stuff as you possibly can. And then you've got the commitments and the timing. So that comes back to the same thing. What is each other's commitments and what is the timing? If there's a decision to be made, what sort of timescale are you going to allow for that decision to be made on? And that's actually quite an important thing to get in there in your head to terms. Of course, what's going to happen with the financing? Obviously, you want to stipulate Harvey Bowes as your brokerage. Um, uh, also, what's the exit? So what's the planned exit for that property? Is it you're going to buy it on a development loan, on a bridging loan, then refinance it and keep it long term? Or is it sale? Um, I don't know why these are bouncing around. So what the ownership structure is, should be in your head to terms. Is it going to be, like we said, 50-50? Is it going to be 70-30? Whatever it is you arrange. Um, how the profits and the liabilities are going to be shared, how they're going to be distributed and when, okay? So that's important to cover. Um, what happens if one party wants to exit early? Actually, you want to stipulate that in your agreement. So I've had one long-term joint venture partner that wants to come out early. That wasn't put in our joint venture agreement. It's a joint venture from years ago. It's performed very well. We owned uh, about a million pounds worth of property together. And uh, we've just agreed to, I'm going to buy out on some. Some of them have gone to the auction. Um, so we've worked it out because it's all amicable. But what if it wasn't amicable? So it's worth stipulating, if one party had an early exit, how might that look? What would be the agreement between you uh, on, on how they would exit? Um, and is there a plan B? So if your first planned exit doesn't work, what's plan B? And really, you want to put that in your head to terms as well, so your contingency is pre-agreed. And the one thing you want to think about when you're looking at your plan B is what is the worst case scenario? And can I deal with the worst case scenario? I always remember listening to Terry Matthews giving a presentation, obviously the owner of the Celtic Manor Resort, um, giving a presentation. And he said, well, when I'm looking to invest in either a tech business or property, because he openly said in the same presentation, he invests roughly 50-50 in tech and property. So whenever I'm looking at I just look at, can I deal with the worst case scenario? And if I can deal with that, I'll go for it. So always think about your worst case scenario. So that becomes your joint venture agreement, okay? What, what is in your head to terms becomes this. And then this is a private uh, uh, document. So it's a document that's just between you and your joint venture partner and anybody you choose to share it with. And it really agrees all of that stuff. All of the stuff that's in your head to terms goes into this formal agreement if you're going to do it correctly. So what then is a shareholders agreement? So a shareholders agreement is a public document. So this is a document that goes onto company's house that is available for anybody to see. So it is in addition to your joint venture agreement and it sets out the rights uh, to transfer interest in the shares to manage the operations of the company and the joint venture. So it is really the rules and regulations of the joint venture. Now this is where most people make a mistake is when you get a property deal on uh, uh, sorry, when you get a company deal by buying from one of those online companies for 20 quid, you get the standard shareholder agreement. And then when you get in your first loan, a couple of days before the loan's going to complete, the legal team for the lender says, oh, by the way, you've got to change that. And it causes a delay, okay, because it's not set up properly for property and property investment because you've just bought something standard off the shelf. So you should always want to know what happens with this, okay? And again, unfortunately, just recently, the same joint venture partner as this on a different deal, basically said with shares, had written into the shareholders agreement that if the shares were divided, we'd have to put more money in. So then on a second deal we did, 
He said, right, we're dividing the shares because it's in that agreement. I can do this. And by dividing the shares, how would you got to put in another 200 grand? I said, well, until I sell these properties at auction, I don't have 200 grand. Okay, then. Off you go. It can be as brutal as that. So and that, that was after I'd found the deal, set the deal up, set up the building contractor, and managed the first two months of the build. So it can happen. It can happen to any of us, even those who are quite experienced. So my lesson from that one is read the bloody share agreement, <laughs> right? So you've always got to get these things checked. Um, and then also the Articles of Association. So what is that document? So this is a public document. Uh, the, it's the purpose of the company. So it's the overall purpose of the company. Um, and what happens to things like dividend payments, uh, operative issues, the voting in the property, borrowing, um, and things like that. Okay, And when you're going to convene general meetings. So it's just the rules, but they are the legal aspects. The joint venture agreement can be whatever you agree between you, but these have to comply with British law and they have to be recorded and they have to be lodged at company's house. So that's what these two documents are. And so many people just get a company online and don't look at the details of these two specific uh, documents and they're really important. So as you know, we have somebody who is incredibly experienced in the legal team at Harvey Bowes. Um, who, uh, who's uh, qualified as a paralegal, so not quite a full solicitor, but did property law in Australia. And we allow her to set up our companies. You don't have to be a lawyer to set up a company. And we can set up companies for you. It is more expensive at £249 than your £25 uh, companies or £14 for some of them that you can get online. But they are set up, therefore, properly with the proper information and you know what's contained in them because we tell you what's there. So if you want us to set up companies for you, you can do, it is cheaper to do it online, but we will set them up so they are legally compliant and they are compliant with lenders and what lenders want to see, as well as protecting you parties rather than just an off the shelf company that could be anything, okay? So just to make you aware of that. Um, couple of things now, just to bring this to a close. I want you to think about anybody you know, because may not be anybody in the room, but who do you know who'd like to run a post office that is not too far away from here? Okay, not too far away from where we are stood and sat today. I want to buy the building, but I don't want to run the business. And there is a profitable business making 70 grand a year that uh, you could, if you want to be a postmaster, please talk to me because I want the building, but I don't want to be postmaster. Um, and so uh, there's a successful business that's trading there. The idea of it for us is that we'll move Harvey Bowes into the upstairs of the building and we'll allow the post office to run rent in their portion of the building off me. Very successful little business to run. I just don't want to run it. Um, so uh, that's something to bear in mind. If you know anybody, there's a great opportunity for somebody that wants to step into business but maybe doesn't have a lot of capital um, and can do a buyout over time with me on that business. Uh, also, don't forget that if you want to join our um, if you want to join this as an annual event, then we charge £245 for an annual membership to this. You come along without paying a ticket price. Then for this event, you also get 10% off your broker fees with Harvey Bowes. So if you do a couple of deals, you'll make that back anyway and get this for free. And also we're including in that at the moment, a, a, is it one ticket or two tickets? Give me. I'm, sometimes I'm so generous. I know, I know, I did say I wasn't greedy, didn't I? Goodness me, two tickets. Um, also two tickets for our Property Investor Awards Wales. So for, who came to the event? So obviously you were there, you won an award. So a few of us came to the event. So we're doing that event again. I think it's the 12th of November uh, this year, so towards the end of the year. We're going to be starting to take entries from the 1st of May for that competition, for who wants to win uh, that award all over social media. Again, it's in partnership with Paul Fosh Auctions, so quite high profile uh, in the community and we're going to be doing that that event again uh, for the 12th of November so just bear that in mind um, next month here just to bring this to a close uh, we've got Alex Louise Brown who is going to be speaking for those who know Alex Louise Brown she's a very very knowledgeable um, uh, property investor who's been investing for a good good number of years very successful in what she does um, and I've known her for probably about 10 years now, acted as her broker and a broker for her husband as well. They've got their own separate property portfolios and do really well, uh, both of them. So they're going to share their nuggets with us. And a lot of the nuggets that Alex Louise will share as well is about how to think about how your properties are cash flowing 
and what you're doing with that cash. She's very good at that side of planning. So she'll have lots of nuggets to give us next month. I hope you're you're going to be here in attendance to listen to that. That's going to be a really good one. Uh, the following month then, we've got um, Trevor Cutmore, if anyone knows Trevor Cutmore. So Trevor has not been on the speaking uh, circuit for a couple of years, maybe four years, maybe longer because of COVID, maybe five, five six years. Um, but he is actually a very funny speaker. He's a brilliant comedian, uh, as well as having a really serious uh, talk as well. Uh, he talks about all sorts of stuff from options, to, um, to how to do some clever flips. Um, very, very good presentations and a very knowledgeable guy. He's based up in Lincoln uh, and he is a, uh, he's quite a big um, uh, property guru um, that's quite well known on the circuit, but he's just been quiet for the last couple of years. So if you're fairly new, you may not have come across him until now, uh, but you'll find him on Google, uh, Trevor Cutmore. And we've also got Luke Rowlands. Um, so Luke is a client of Harvey Bose, um, which, uh, which I'm kind of proud of, given the fact that he is also the co-host of Cardiff Pin with another mortgage broker. <laughs> I think that says a lot. So, um, so he's uh, one of our clients. He's coming to talk to, to um, us uh, next month about some of the successful projects that he's done. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to that. So that's Luke Rowlands, who's going to be here. So we've got two great speakers for June as well. Um, so that just leaves me now to say thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry that we went on a little bit this evening. Did you get value from it, though? Has it been good? Great, okay. So about five minutes from now, you're gonna find me in the bar. Thank you very much. <laughs>